So Anthony, when we spoke, you know, six and a half, almost seven years ago, you told me that that liaisons was a project that quote has dictated its own path, whether it was financial or artistic, each shift always proved a positive direction for it. So I'm wondering what kind of shifts took place after the release of the original album? Okay, well, um, the album was released, released in uh, 2015. And I continued for the next two years, there were still many more concerts associated with the release of the album. Um, certain venues uh, around the country uh, brought me back for return engagements because of there were so many pieces. So they're like, okay, bring us a new batch from the, you know, from the original collection. Um, and that was nice. And I did a, in 2016, I was able to do, uh, um, uh, in June of that year, I did uh, a tour of Australia where in the city of, uh, specifically in the city of Melbourne, they wanted the complete project over three concerts, which, uh, which I did, which was a lot. Um, and then I did a, single concert in Sydney as well. And then later that fall, um, uh, I uh, uh, did several performances around England, uh, three or four different cities, uh, with the main concert being in London at the Barbican uh, as part of the jazz uh, festival there. And, um, and uh, that featured a, a wide uh, range of the works as well. In 2017, it was, uh, the, I remember it was around the end of the summer of 2017 or the fall, my manager at the time had just um, mentioned in passing, um, you know, she said Sondheim's birthday is coming up in 2020. Are you think, have you planned for anything? Well, me and Rachel Colbert, the producer, uh, we started to think over those next months and, you know, throwing the idea around. And then in, in 2018, I was invited to perform on Symphony Spaces wall to wall. Uh, that year they were celebrating Steve Reich for his 80th birthday year. And uh, they did a conversation with him and Stephen Sondheim on, on stage, and I played Finishing the Hat, uh, Steve Reich's uh, two piano version. And um, uh, that evening in the green room, I remember talking to uh, Steve Sondheim for the first time about this possible extension. And we said, you know, we're thinking of doing this uh, to get it started now, since it's two years out. Uh, for your birthday uh, year in, in 2020. And we were trying to decide how many more pieces and there were some jokes that flew around about whether it should be 45 because 45 is half of 90, meaning, um, you know, a total of 45. In any case, after some time, we just decided to round it up from 36. Uh, it was actually 36 plus one because I had written one to start the project early on, which was included in the recording. Um, so we, we rounded it up to 50 and added with the 36, 14 new pieces. Um, and then over that, the course of that uh, year from 2018, a, a lot of the piece, most nearly all of them came in in 2019. And I was getting ready for, we were doing going to do the world premiere in New York at the 92nd Street Y at the end of March, just a few days, a week after. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, Sondheim's 90th birthday. And then um, at Royce Hall was going to be several, it was gonna be the next month. And then there were a lot of other concerts that were booked around the country. Of course, all of that was canceled and uh, right before all of this. So I had learned everything, prepared them, uh, played several of them for the different composers. Um, I mean, I will say this about that, the new collection of 14, what I was pleased with was that a lot of the composers um, chose songs that I originally wanted included, but were chosen the first time around. So it was filling in a lot of gaps. I mean, there's still some I wish were still part of it that aren't, but, um, and the composers again were from a wide range of genres. Right. You do realize that if you go to the ASCAP site and look at the number of, of titles that Steve, is, Steve Sondheim was associated with, um, you know, it counts over 800. Now, of course, some of those were where he wrote lyrics. Some of them are actually the transcriptions from your project. So conservatively, we can say there are probably 650 songs. So you have another 600 to choose from. <laughs> right. That's true. You know, it's, it's, it's curious because then through the pandemic, I did record a few of them at home, which I just never liked recording at home during that period. Some people 
got that together really well. I mean, I bought microphones and all that, but, but I recorded them basically to send to him because I wanted him to hear them. And, uh, and then we went back and forth on some of the pieces. And then um, this past year, of course, I sent him more scores and he was, he was about to come to the 2018 concert, um, which was the first of two that I'm doing at Merkin Hall here at the Kaufman Music Center in New York City. Uh, the first one was in November. The second one is uh, a week from Saturday on the 26th of March. Uh, and the premieres were divided between the two concerts, um, six on the first, eight on this coming uh, up one, along with some of the selections from the original collection, which is similar to what I'm doing at, uh, at Royce Hall. And um, he was set to come to that concert to hear those. Uh, but it he, he died actually a week later. But... Um, it was just a few days before, uh, or a couple of days before, no, I'm sorry, uh, a few days before earlier that week, he had gone to the um, the, pre the first preview of Assassins Off-Broadway on a Sunday, and then the opening night of Company the next night on the Monday. And then by Thursday afternoon, he said his doctor, he was having trouble with his, his foot. He had had an accident. And um, his doctor told him he had to stay off it. So he, he couldn't come to the concert uh, at the last minute. And then of course, uh, you know, shockingly and unexpectedly a week later we lost him. Um, so this, like, the upcoming, I'm sorry? It seemed like he was gonna be around forever, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, everybody, and it's funny that many people sit, have said that. You just, you didn't conceive of him going yet. You just, even though he was gonna be 90, he was 91. Um, in this concert at Merkin Hall now would have been, um, just a few days after his 92nd birthday. Um, and then of course, Royce Hall is just a couple weeks later, uh, which is, is nice timing. I mean, I'm grateful that all the concerts that had to be canceled during the pandemic, they've all been rescheduled um, for the most part, nearly all of them. And um, I was really grateful for that because it's been nice. Some I've been playing some of the new pieces in a couple of the venues just as sneak previews because I really just wanted to play them before I actually gave the actual premiere. Now, when we spoke before, you mentioned that the composers came to you and said, this is the song I would like to do. Is that the same for these new pieces that are part of the team? Yeah, um, I gave them that uh, the revised wish list, meaning I, with, I took off any pieces that were already taken. Although if someone wanted to repeat a piece that was already done that we don't say no to it. Um, that's only happened, and that happened with, in the new collection with one, uh, the composer Kevin Putz chose Being Alive uh, from Company, which would, had been chosen previously by Gabriel Kahane uh, in the first collection. And they're very, very different <laughs> takes on the song, which is what makes it really interesting. Um, you know, it's interesting. But, I, rec I recently spoke to Ethan Iverson, you know, who, you know, was shocked when he said, well, is anybody doing Send in the Clowns? <laughs> yeah, that was in his email way back when, when we first invited him. Um, uh, Rachel Colbert had sent him the list and she sort of asterisk those that had been chosen. <laughs> he, his, his subject line was, what? No one is, no one wants Send in the Clowns. <laughs> and it was, I think everybody at the time I mean, it's partially quoted in another piece, but it's not really, you know, based on the song, that particular piece uh, by this other composer. But um, I think many people said they were not so much afraid of it. It's just that, you know, they were, they just didn't know what they would do with it because there's so many versions of it. Um, but Ethan's is so unusual. It just added all the more excitement and integrity to the, the, to, uh, the setting. What's interesting to me is, is that, you know, as, as a lapsed piano performance major, the thing that always stood out to me was sometimes you can harmony and how it isn't the chords, it's how you get to the chords that ultimately, right. you know, is part of the architecture of his writing. And in, you know, and in listening yeah, keep, to pieces, it seems like everybody took that to heart as well. Yes, and one composer recently, I'll mention Kevin Putz again, because even in Kevin's, I'm bringing, I'm just going to, looking at his program note for the piece. Uh, he said, um, he said, 
uh, he, he starts it by saying that a, a different composer that he knows very well and who he admires had labeled him a, a harmonist. And he said he had to agree. So he said, it's no surprise that it was Sondheim's utterly unique harmonic vocabulary that drew me to his music. And his setting of the piece actually is completely based in all those harmonic shifts, which is what gives the piece, I think, its excitement as well as its passion. And there's this beautiful arc in that builds in the piece like it does in the song, in the original song. And he does that through the harmony and, and escaping at different times into other harmonies, but always with the trajectory and the direction of it leading to that climax, uh, which I think is what makes the piece so satisfying. Right. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned Kevin, um, because Kevin was originally um, part of the, the first batch. That you were right. Doing. And then had to drop out because of right. The it, it's yeah. When he won the Pulitzer Prize a month later, he dropped out because he was just flooded with commissions that he he said he had to take. And you know, he just he did say he goes, you know, if, if there's an extent because we had talked even way back then that because so many composers who weren't part of the original collection had said, you know, oh gee, if you decide to extend this, I would love to be part of it. So I knew when it came time to choose for the. Uh, the new commissions for the, his 90th, uh, Kevin was one of the first people I approached because I had remembered distinctly that he had, had said that and he was all ready to do it. Um, and I guess the flip side of that, if I remember from our previous conversation is Adam Gettle, who just said that he, he just didn't know he would ever get around to it. And I'm assuming given that he's not on the list of 14, that he's gonna have to be in the second 50 if at all. <laughs> right. And I really wish, you know, we all, we all had wished he had said yes. I mean, he did say yes and was there for a while, but uh, I, I don't know, for a variety of reasons. At one point he said he was having trouble with his one of his hands and he was having trouble playing. Uh, that was many years ago when he had to finally drop out. But uh, he was going, originally he was going to choose the title music from the film Stavisky, which Sondheim scored. And when I listened to it, I remember oh God, this really would make a great piano piece. You know, it's just the energy of it. And just in, in Adam's uh, hands, I mean, in Adam's capacity for what he does, I just thought it was a, a perfect uh, marriage um, of him choosing that song. Well, I could see that piece. I could see him taking that in a fully romantic, big, big, almost orchestral sounding way. Right, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the composers has done that with a different song. It's from also from a film. Um, he's a German theater composer who Sondheim has been fond of for many years. They're very, they were very, very close friends. A young German composer, very successful in Germany. His name is Mark Schubring. And Sondheim made a special request that I ask him into for these for the new batch. And he chose Goodbye for Now, which is from Reds. And he made a really, uh, he also plays the piano extremely well. And he's an amazing painter um, and illustrator. And um, he made this really beautiful, uh, full bodied piano work out of that song. Uh, and he even sent it after the pandemic started because uh, Mark was supposed to, was gonna be coming over that year for the concerts as well. He is coming next week because I'll be premiering it. Um, but uh he had sent the score um and a sort of a Sibelius midi realization of it to him and Sondheim was just completely taken with it um I mean his his words uh, Mark just recently sent us that exchange that he had by email with him and it seems that Sondheim said it was actually uh, really spectacular and um uh and it's funny because in his note he had said in the original note, when Mark wrote to him, uh, Steve Sondheim had written back saying, um, uh, I, I, I don't know if you, I don't think you attached the score, but if you did, maybe it got lost in my to be stolen file. Because <laughs> 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 he just admired what Mark did uh, so much. And Mark also did this very touching he did this very touching um, uh, 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 addition to the piece, which is he marked, he labeled the measure numbers starting at 1930 uh, up to 19, uh, uh, up to 2021, um, which is very touching. I think it's so it's it's 91 measures long. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. 
So if people want to hear these new transcriptions, now it seems like the only way to do that is to attend one of the performances. But are there plans to record them? Yeah, I am planning to record them. Uh, ECM is not sure just yet. Uh, they're way behind because of the pandemic. So they were saying like they couldn't do it now because of they there's a backlog. So we're you know, and they said it's perfectly fine if we want to go to um, a, a different label. So I, I want it to be again a really uh, good label that will you know because ECM was the perfect home for it in many ways. Um, so we'll see, but I'm planning to record it. Um, Probably in 2023, I'll, I'll start doing, I'll, I'll do them because I will have played them enough and they'll be ready. Are there plans to have additional compositions? Not right now. Um, you know, never say never. Uh, we said at the end of the first, at the end of the 36, you know, we said, okay, I don't know right now because it was such a big mountain of a project to surmount at the time. And, um, and this was obviously easier because it was less pieces and we already knew how to go about everything. You know, it, it, it was, it became, this process was much more fluid the second time around. Um, and, uh, and it worked out well. And we had, again, we really covered the diversity and uh, of all of that, which I was happy about. Well, you're like, you're like Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> more now. <laughs> right. Um, so you mentioned that you had a list of uh, songs that you wish that composers had chosen, that, and there are still songs that hadn't, that haven't been chosen yet. What's, what's right. On, what's on your wish list? Should there be more? more that should. Um, well, I have been for years, even from the original collection, I had wanted someone to set the opening number of Company, because um, I thought that would make a great piano piece. Um, the, uh, the opening of Pacific Overtures, the advantages of floating in the middle of the sea, which I thought also um, uh, getting married today uh, could make a really fast, virtuosic, wonderful uh, piece. Um, oh, uh, the song from Evening Primrose, which is just escaping me now. Um, I remember. I remember, right. And also with so little to be sure of from Anyone Can Whistle. Um, we do have everybody says don't now front and it's, a, it's an amazing virtuosic fun rompy version uh, by a new york theater composer uh, mark bennett also a favorite of sondheim's uh a composer that he really admires and uh, he's also a very a long time friend of mine uh, which, so it was an it was a perfect match there to have him in the project now i i i purchased the book once once these transcriptions were published and then i went oh i should have stayed in music school uh, so, you know, I'm wondering how your relationship to them has changed and evolved over time. And I'm assuming that with time, the muscle memory is there, you know, that yeah. it becomes easier to perform and maybe add your own distinctive take on it. Right. Yeah. Some of them have grown beyond even from the recording when I revisited them again. Um, I was a little frustrated with some of them that I hadn't played because of the pandemic or whatever. I hadn't played them in like two years. And um, I was frustrated because they were a little rusty. And I was like, oh dear, I played these so much for years and now they're rusty. It was like, you know, what's going on here? But the thing is in relearning them, it all did come back. Just as you just said, uh, the muscle memory. Um, and, and I was able to relax with them a little more, let them breathe more um uh and also uh, this has happened now with, even with the new pieces i think because i learned them and then there was this stop gap like you can't do this and then all of a sudden you know a year and a half later i'm able to to start working on them again um but yeah i think um they have they have changed i mean i this is something funny that i like to tell you know a lot of the original from the pieces from the original collection are being performed by other pianists and students and i love hearing that certain people find a lot of them so difficult because here during that process it was only me playing them and i thought oh my god what's wrong these are really really difficult you know but people are are really understanding the uh, the challenge that some of the, the pieces, the challenges that some of the pieces actually pose. And in terms of your relationship to them emotionally, I mean, you're now performing them, you know, several months after Sondheim's passing. 
how how did, how was how was your emotional response shifted both over time since you first started tackling them and now in the wake of his passing? Yeah, I mean, some of them, some of them do make me cry. Um, even when I'm I'm playing, I'm sort of crying inside, or, or no one can tell that I am. Um, I I I was sort of emotionally attached. I think that as anyone would to each piece. Um, because it's something that you take on as a close friend, you get to know it, it becomes part of you. And plus you're the only one who has the relationship other than the composer with that piece before other people take it on. Um, so each, as, as Rachel put it, she said in many ways, these were like, especially during the pandemic, these were dark, dark light. Uh, these were lights in the darkness uh, of the pandemic. Um, and even the new pieces took on that role as well. Um, many of them are very emotional for me. I mean, Kevin puts his version of being alive, David uh, Rakowski's setting of the ladies who lunch, always Paul Moravec's version of um, um, losing my mind, which he calls, I think about you. That even with audiences that provoked a lot of emotional responses uh, because of the arc and the trajectory that he, he creates with the piece. Um, and there are many others. Steve Reich's finishing the hat still is popular. It, it just never gets old. Um, it's fun to play. I will be doing it next week in New York with uh, Conrad Tao. Um, and cause he did do, he did uh, a piece also for the new collection. He did a two piano version, which I'll be playing with him as well of move on from Sunday in the park, which was one of the songs I always wanted set. And I'll be doing it in uh, Ed Royce with Gloria Chang. And she'll join me with the Reich as well. Well, good. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the concert. Um, now, you have a second piece that's part of the 14 as well. Um, how and why did you choose All Things Bright and Beautiful to follow? It, I, it was chosen for me. <laughs> um, it goes back to one of the, I can't remember if it was, I think it was the first no, I can't remember now. It was the first or second Symphony Space concert back in 2012 or 2013. My partner, Tom, was in the green room and Sondheim was in the green room and they got into a conversation. And Tom just happened to mention to him, you know, one of the songs I've always loved of yours is uh, All Things Bright and Beautiful. And uh, Sondheim looked and said, you know, I've always loved that one too. And I was really sorry that it had to be taken out of the show. Now, what he did do is um, he did use it in the opening prologue of Follies. He orchestrated it. Um, and so when the new batch came around, um, Rachel and a few other people thought, you know, they asked, because in the first round, that one that I created at the very beginning based on Sunday in the Park, people responded very positively to it. So Rachel and several others uh, many years later came to me and said, she goes, you know, I think you should do another one. And Tom, my partner said, you know, I think you should do all things bright and beautiful. So I looked at it and I, I got the vocal score. And then I went back, I got at where I teach at Manhattan School of Music. They have the complete uh, full uh, scores of all the Sondheim shows. And I went to, um, to Follies and looked at the prologue. And uh, what I did is extracted from the prologue as well as from the original song itself and created, uh, you know, what was a, a piano piece that I find when I do these things, I tend to pay homage to other composers. Um, there's, I, it, it sort of comments on, of course, Ravel, because Sondheim loved Ravel, uh, a little bit of Satie, but there's a touch of Richard Rogers in there. There's a touch of Macy, Olivier Macyon in there. Uh, there's a touch of John Adams. Um, and it just sort of all happened by chance that as the piece started to be written, um, uh, I just went in these directions. Now, I won't be performing that piece in at Royce Hall. I'm performing the uh, Sunday in the Park piece instead. Um, there was a, it's a real, been a real balance act for the Royce Hall program because it's in two large parts uh, with an intermission. And I've had to leave off some pieces that I just did not want to, you know, but I had to make choices because of time length and everything. And we wanted to show a, a, a good diversity and range, not only in the styles and uh, also of the composers. 
we know Taylor Mac did a 24 hour concert. So I see no reason why you can't do all, all 50 in one performance. In one performance, yes. And then uh -huh. I'll just collapse. <laughs> Marathon day of music. <laughs> right. Right. That would be something that would be that would be horrifying to you, wouldn't it? I, the thing is, you know, it just came up about, uh, what was it, last weekend I had a couple of people here to play through some things. And uh, we were talking and we thought, you know, gee, maybe it might be nice at one point if I organized all 50 as a marathon with a variety of pianists, you know, divide them up. I mean, I play some and, and get, a, you know, and, and do this in different cities and use pianists from the different cities uh, to, to take part of, in it. Uh, I thought that might be a, you know, a really fun idea. You know, one of the things that Sondheim was always concerned about, I'm not sure concern is the right word, but, but he was hopeful that he would be admired as much for, as a composer as he was as a lyricist. And on what level do you think that, that the liaisons project has helped move the needle in terms of people's appreciation for him as a composer? I think, you know, that was the mission of the project from the beginning was to show him because I felt he was one of the great American composers uh, of the 20th and 21st century. Um, and we discovered that most, nearly all of the composers felt in some way, they said he either secretly has influenced them or their admiration for him has led them, led them to be, led to their excitement about being part of the project. Um, I think in emphasizing him as a composer, these piano pieces really have done a great service to him for that. You know what I mean? But in the hands of each composer, as I've said in interviews, and I may have said this to you several years ago, is that each piece is the perfect marriage between Sondheim's original material and the composer's style. When you hear the pieces, you hear the compo you know that's that composer. Um, and I think with that, um, listeners have also uh, found a kind of profound awareness now, uh, a deeper awareness of him as a composer. Um, and of course, you know, we had set parameters, please. He wanted people to maintain the melody as much as possible and to retain as much of the harmony. He realized that these are based on original songs, which he said, you know, his, his material was uh, expanded by lyrics and narrative. And in this case, there, these, this is a, an instrumental piece. And he realized that the structure or form of each piece would change because it's an instrument, there's an instrumental trajectory to the piece. And many of them did, I think nearly all the composers took that into account. I mean, some did very direct transcriptions. Others, you know, really took the reimagining idea to heart. Yeah, you can compare what Nico Muley did to what Ethan Iverson did. Right. And those, right. For example, Nico is, is, you know, you can hear that melody straight up, right out. Of right. And with Ethan's, it's, you know, you have to do a little bit. Right. Well, Ethan's has that story behind it. It's, I, I don't know if he told you that it, it takes place, basically, he, he imagines it in a kind of a, 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 a jazz club or a bar and there's this uh jazz band brass band on another out on another behind a wall playing this this other tune which is what opens the piece and comes back a few times in the piano piece and then the other is the is the man at an upright piano struggling to try to play <laughs> send in the clowns but he keeps being bombarded by this brass band and i think that's what sets off the quirkiness of the piece um Absolutely. Now, if I look at the at the list of the of the fourteen, I I think there are, are there three songs from Assassins and, and one or two. There are two. Two songs. No, no, you're no. There are there are two composers and three songs. <laughs> it's uh, John Batiste chose the Gun Song and he combined it with the Ballad of Booth. And Ted Hearn, who was commissioned by uh, UCLA Cap. Um, Ted Hearn t chose uh, another national anthem. Now, I and find it interesting that, that particularly those songs in particular happen when they did. And I'm wondering if somehow there's a response to what was going on in this country. At the time. That, yeah, I mean, John's setting of the two, it's um, what he has done is what you'll hear 
is he juxtaposes over it their audio tracks, spoken word audio tracks at different points in the piece. Uh, they are all uh, 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 vintage footing, uh, vintage footage of um, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, John F. Kennedy, and there's a very disturbing one from Donald Trump, um, which he combines with the AOC um, uh, excerpt. Um, and um, it's actually, they work, they're very effective over the setting. And in the piano part at the times when they're speaking, the piano part is actually very subtle so that the audience can really hear what what each of these speakers is, is actually saying. And then there's a long middle section, which is just solo piano uh, before the end. It ends with John F. Kennedy speaking in this very eloquent, eloquent uh, thing, uh, eloquent statement he uh, delivery he gave where he cites NATO. And I just found like even now it's even more potent, um, completely unexpectedly, uh, how effective it is at this time. And um, yeah, and, and um, Ted Hearn's setting of another national anthem, he said, you know, it's an anthem for the dispossessed is basically what he says. Those that, you know, wanted the American dream, but, you know, couldn't find it and were so their deepest disappointment and anger led them to, you know, violence. And um, his setting is really edgy. Uh, the song is there. It's there in spades. Um, <laughs> boy. He's really made it dramatic, and he's added a, a sound effect in the piano as well to it. Well, it sounds like it could be the underscore for January 6th. Say that again, I'm sorry? It could be the underscore for a documentary on January 6th. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, and yeah, so those are the ones from Assassins, and, um, and I was happy to have another one from Passion, a lesser known show, and I was happy to have another Pacific Overtures, as well as Anyone Can Whistle. Um, there are two Anyone Can Whistles. Max Richter did a very simple but eloquent setting of the main tune. And uh, Mark Bennett did, of course, Everybody Says Don't. Right. Now, since Steve's passing, you know, we know that there, are, there was a musical that was at least half composed. We know that there are songs that haven't seen the light of day. Light of day. Do you anticipate maintaining a relationship with the estate you know, so that perhaps some of these undiscovered pieces may be discovered vis-a-vis -vis your work, whether it's liaisons or something else? Yeah, I mean, we hope to keep contact with them. I mean, we've just invited um, three of them to the concert next Saturday here in New York. Um, and I know, I think the show was nearly completed. I know that a workshop was done two or three years ago of Act One for a closed audience on an afternoon, they hired uh, several actors to learn it. And it was sort of a, a musical reading. Um, and I guess that was very successful. And then um, I don't know, you know, I would hate to have it go by the wayside. I hope, you know, I think of the case of Bela Bartok when he died in 1945, his, one of his last pieces was his third piano concerto. And he did have an associate who worked with him. And the piano concerto was just about finished. He had made sketches for the final section. And his associate put that together uh, as, as best as he thought that Bartok would do it, would have done, been able to, to um, uh, assemble it. And it's, it's now, of course, it's, it's historic, the, the piece itself. Um, I'm just hoping that if there, and I don't know this for a fact, if there are parts of the new show, I know that the title they settled down was Square One. And if there are parts of that at the, you know, that need to be completed, I hope there is someone. I'm wondering if Jonathan Tunick would be the person who could do that because he's, you know, he's been his orchestrator for so many years. Right. And I believe, I believe they did a second reading last year with her. Yes, that's right. You're right. That's true. So yeah, it would be it would be great to have one more musical. I know, I know. We, that's what we were all hoping for. You know, he's going to live to see this this piece, to see the new musical done. You know, um, it's curious. It, it is. It is. Well, I want to conclude our conversation Anthony, by asking you to compare. You know, where you are today. I mean, if you go back eleven years ago that afternoon 
um, we invited Sean Piper to the call for him to listen to the first batch of these covenants. And you look at where the project is today. What stands out to you most about this over decades long journey that you've taken with Stephen Sondheim's music? What stands out is that I've grown to know the music. I think through these pieces, I've grown to know it even more deeply, even the original songs, they've revealed more and more to me. Um, and I think, you know, what has been invaluable was his, uh, his, his uh, support, his, um, and not only his support, but even in those, like that first session, which was a fundraiser where he invited some people over who would commission. And we had about 15 or 20 people in the room to listen to the first sort of eight that were completed at the time. And it was a very joyous and very successful evening. And he seemed very pleased. And he went home and he called and he, he wrote me that night and said, oh, you know, on the car on the way home, I just thought of two other composers you have to ask. And one was Thomas Newman, the film composer, who he has been a close friend of his for years, who he helped even start his career. And, um, and then a year or so later, when I invited him over privately to hear for the second concert, to hear some of the pieces, it's always been his feedback, his... Um, uh, his insights into the pieces that helped me as well as the composers. The composers would always say, gee, did you play it for him? What did he say? What did he say? <laughs> and, and anything that he wanted corrected or slightly changed, which was very minimal uh, at the time, they would say, oh yeah, no, he's right. He's right. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. You know, they were all very, everybody's always been as we have been. Um, we, we cater to what it was he wanted um, each step of the way. And he was never demanding. It was always, this is where we are, what do you think? And he would come back and say, oh no, this is great, keep going. Or, you know, he would offer his suggestions. And I think that helped me to get to know him and his work better because I got to, I got a little bit of a window into how he worked privately on his own shows when he was writing them. You know, you get those, it's like looking through the shutters to see a little bit of that through some of his responses to playing for him privately. And I think that's helped me. But I think overall to answer your question, it's just been living with the pieces. You know, it's it's a body of work that uh, I hold very close to my own heart. And so each piece is in its own way, as I said earlier, each piece is like a personal friend. And there's sort of an individual relationship to each one as well, even those that are extremely challenging, you know, um, to try to keep those challenges in check and, and try to, you know, make them as uh, help to make the pieces easier to play as possible for myself. And I think you've come to the realization that we'll never be like Mr. That's true. Yeah, people asked me years ago, you know, gee, when this is over, you're going to choose another project like this, like with another compo you know, another composer or a pop composer or something. And I was like, it didn't really dawn on me. It hasn't dawned. There was, this was a purpose with this. Um, and I feel very gratified and I feel very fortunate to have been able to do it.